screen. All right, try talking again. Stories and people tell us So backtrack a little bit um, and introduce us to what we're going to see today. Okay, very good. All right, so are we good? Yeah, we're good. Excellent. All right, so sorry about the technical difficulties, folks. But uh, just to recap, we're going to be going through our Story of Virginia exhibit today, talking about examples of communication and history from about the mid-1600s, and we're going to get all the way to the late 1800s. So that's going to be sort of our time frame. So we're starting here in the mid-1600s. And, and before we talk about the objects, though, I, I do want to talk about our first focus, which will be on how museums tell the stories we do. How do we communicate uh, the past and stories of the past? Well, we do, th we do so through the study of what we call material culture, basically looking at objects and seeing what those objects tell us about the people who used them or made them. So it's connecting things to people in their lives. And a great example of why material culture is important is looking at the early um, English settlement here in the United States and Virginia, because there were, aren't very many um, uh, written records that they left behind. So we have to look at the objects they left behind to tell us about their lives. So some examples that we see on display here that are from Jordan's journey and early English settlement here in the colony of Virginia, we have a large, um, a jar that was used to transport olive oil or olives from the Mediterranean here to Virginia. So it's showing that uh, the colony of Virginia, while an English colony, is still connected to Europe. And not only England, it's connected to the Mediterranean world, something that we might not necessarily associate Virginia with. Now, if we're looking at the other objects that are on display from Jordan's journey, we see a lot of pottery and ceramics, many of which come from England, but others also are going to come from um, other European countries. So we see at the uh, top right, we have a tile from... Um, from the Netherlands. It's a Dutch tile, but it's interesting because it's a decorative tile and on it there are scenes from Africa. There are camels and flora and fauna from, um, from Africa. And this is showing again the connection between Virginia and Europe and the African continent. Much of that connection is going to be because of the institution of slavery and the slave trade. Europeans are enslaving Africans and bringing them here to Virginia and so they're interacting with that society and it's going to be reflected in some of the objects that they create. We can also see um, a, an iron hoe that was used to cultivate tobacco. So that's telling us about what um, uh, the English colonists here were growing. They were growing this cash cop crop, which was the basis of their society. Um, and that is also connected to the tile because it's why um, enslaved people were brought over here because they uh, wanted to enslave Africans to use them um, to grow tobacco more cheaply. And then lastly, we can look at this piece of armor to show that English settlement here in Virginia was not necessarily a peaceful affair. There were already people living here in Virginia, and English settlers were displacing them. And often there was conflict with um, Native Virginians, um, Native Americans. And so the English had to import armor as well to protect them. And it's interesting, too, because is something we associate with like the Middle Ages or Dark Ages. And the 1600s is a time of development, sort of that transfer time between older ways of warfare and, and knights and more modern ways of using um, weapons and, um, and, and guns and things like that when armor is going to uh, start to be not as effective anymore. So now that we've talked about sort of the early days of settlement here in Virginia, we're going to move through time and we're moving from the uh, 1600s into the 1700s. And as Virginians are growing more wealthy and growing more powerful, again, mainly through uh, plant the plantation economy, which relies on the enslaved labor of Africans. But as Virginians are growing more wealthy and powerful, they're going to start drifting away from their English roots. And they're going to start to say, why do we have to listen to English politicians that are thousands of miles across the ocean that have never been here in the colony of Virginia? Maybe we should have more of a say in how we govern ourselves. So during especially the 1760s and 1770s, we're going to see prominent Virginians start speaking out against English rule. And this will be the origins of the American Revolution. Now, it's really interesting to see the rhetoric and the words that uh, Virginians are using to communicate their displeasure with English rule. And one of the best examples is to look at this guy and this painting up here. So this is a painting of Patrick Henry, um, one of the most famous Virginian revolutionaries, giving a speech in a courthouse in Virginia. Um, and this is known as the Parsons Cause. This event actually happened in 1763, so you know, 10, 12 years before the American Revolution occurred. 
Um, but this is the event that made Patrick Henry famous. His speech here really made a big impact on how people viewed him. And it's interesting to look at the words that Patrick Henry is using, both in this speech and then also in his, um, in his later speeches during the revolution, like the give me liberty or give me death speech, because he's using words related to slavery. He is threatening, uh, he is saying to colonists how um, uh, England is going to enslave us if we don't fight back against them. They're going to put us in chains. So it's really interesting to see that revolutionary leaders are using the words of slavery because prominent wealthy Virginians are so afraid of it. So it's, it's speaking to this great um, contradiction in the American Revolution, the founding of our country, where people who owned so many enslaved people and it was such a basis for their lives are um, also deathly afraid of it happening to them. And they're morally opposed to it happening to them. So this interesting uh, contradiction in the founding of our country. And we can also look at this contradiction that's going to be in place in some of the founding documents of the revolution and our country as well. And this is a great example of one of those founding documents, which is the Virginia Declaration of Rights. So the Virginia Declaration of Rights was um, created in the spring of 1776 by uh, George Mason. And George Mason, one of our un, uh, rather unknown founding fathers. Um, but this is a very important document because it lays the groundwork that is going to be very influential in later documents. So how about we move from the Virginia Declaration of Rights and talk about its impact on some of our bigger founding documents in Virginia. And as we move to talk about our founding fathers um, and, and the words that they used to found our country, we can take a quick look at maybe a device they would have used to write these founding documents. This is an example of uh, a replica of a writing desk that Thomas Jefferson might have used um, to write some of the, his very important documents. We can also see uh, Patrick Henry's glasses that he owned. Um, it, was, it was said that before Patrick Henry would give one of his best speeches, he would always push his glasses to the top of his head. So as we, um, as we talk about the, the words that founding fathers are going to be using, we can you know, use the example of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. And here we have a portrait of George Mason, the man who is going to um, write that document. Um, and Mason is saying in the document, he's saying how uh, Americans or Virginians have the inherent right to uh, govern themselves, that the government exists at the will of the people. So the government is there to serve the people. He also talks about separation of powers and religious liberties, protection of the press. So while these doc this, this document is extremely influential and it will lead uh, Thomas Jefferson, who we see here, also uh, James Madison, who we have a portrait of over here, when they write the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights respectively, those same words that are in uh, George Mason's Declaration, Virginia Declaration of Rights, are going to find them their way into um, the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, especially like um, Virginians' rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those direct words Thomas Jefferson takes from the Virginia De uh, Declaration of Rights. But it's also an interesting uh, way to look at these founding documents and see what the founders are leaving out. Because while they're talking about the rights of all Virginians or the rights of all Americans to these inherent liberties, what do they mean? Who do they mean by that? Well, they don't actually mean everybody because they're uh, explicitly leaving out African Americans, both free and enslaved, women, uh, and Native Americans. So these um, large groups of people are excluded, but not only them, also many white Americans as well. Because at the time of our founding, there are property requirements to be able to vote in elections and to be able to obtain the full rights of citizenship. So it's not till much, much later in our history where we start to get closer to the ideals that our founding fathers put into these documents. And arguably, you could say that we're still trying to achieve those ideals even today. So an interesting, um, an interesting way to view how our, our founding uh, fathers communicated the ideals of our country and um, their impacts on us today. So we're going to keep moving on 
through time. We're leaving the time of the revolution. We're leaving the founding of our country. And we're going to move more into the mid-1800s. And during this time, the country and Virginia are rapidly growing in both population and size. And um, due to that growth, we're going to see Virginians start moving into the new territories that the United States acquires in the mid-1800s. And they're going to be doing so in um, a wagon like you see here. This Conestoga wagon was used by thousands of Virginians as they traveled into um, the West. And Virginians are going to be really important in, in, the, um, in the founding of these new uh, territories that are going to become states. And we see Virginians, uh, native Virginians, are these important political leaders in these other states as well. But it's important to note that as uh, Virginia is growing uh, in population and it's growing in size and so is the country, so is the population of enslaved people in America and in Virginia. Um, enslaved people are still integral to the American and especially the Southern economy. And not only the economy, but the culture and society as well. However, we need to look at how uh, objects and stories can communicate the lives uh, and the culture of these enslaved people. It's especially relevant um, because enslaved people are oppressed and they aren't going to be able to acquire as many items and oftentimes aren't educated so they can't leave us written records. We need to look at what objects they do leave behind, but also look at the stories and the culture they leave behind as well. So it's a great example to look at uh, the importance of music to the lives of enslaved people because when enslaved Africans are brought from Africa to Virginia, they don't forget about their past lives. They're going to bring the culture that they had in Africa with them. And that's going to include the importance of music. So when enslaved Africans are brought here to Virginia, they're going to build um, their own banjos or guitars that you can see an example of here. They're going to do so with gourds and animal skin. They're also going to build um, their own drums and use these instruments to continue to play the music that will remind them of where they came from. And they're also going to use music as forms of resistance and forms of forming a community. Um, so we can talk about resistance. Um, on a plantation, enslaved people might use music to communicate to one another in plain view of their enslavers. They might talk about ways to slow down work, to subvert the plantation system, or they might talk about plans to escape. Um, which they might not have otherwise been able to talk about. And they'll use music to communicate with one another. They can also use uh, music to, as I said, form a close community. They could um, talk about reminding themselves of their homeland and also uh, working together using music to regulate their, uh, their pace of work so they can get the task that they're forced to do done in a more efficient manner often. Um, so this music is going to be very important to enslaved people, and it carries on into today in African-American communities and culture. And we see the importance of music being used in uh, bluegrass, uh, country music, um, the blues. And that forms still the, uh, and these, it has its origins during the period of slavery here in the United States. So now that we've talked a little bit about how communication through music is so important to enslaved people here, in Virginia. We're going to move through time again, and we're going to move from the mid-1800s to the 1860s. And here in Virginia, the 1860s is going to be dominated by the American Civil War. So when the American Civil War begins in 1861, after the southern states secede and form the Confederate States of America over the issue of slavery, the war is going to um, start, but people on both sides did not think the war was going to last very long. Both sides thought, maybe we'll just have to fight a battle or two, and the other side will give up, and the war will be over. But that quickly did not happen. And one of the main reasons that that did not happen was because of the huge technological developments that occurred before and during the American Civil War. And one of the biggest areas of technological developments are going to be around communication. So we're going to focus on a couple of those examples right now. Now, the first one we're going to discuss is the innovation in uh, the telegraph. And telegraphs are going to be very, very important um, to armies and governments to communicate back and forth with one another very, very quickly. It will also be important to communicate news of the war from the battlefield to the home front. So people, at civilians at home, will know how the war is going much more quickly. 
And connected to the development of the telegraph and its impact on the war will be the role of newspaper men during the war. Newspapers had really exploded in popularity, and we're going to see dozens of wartime reporters on the battlefield, on the battlefield, um, uh, immediately sending word home from the battle. So people at home are going to know what's going on very quickly. And also connected to that are going to be wartime sketch artists. Um, we can see an example of wartime sketch artist Alfred Wad, one of the most famous. And they're going to be showing depictions of what the camp life looks like, what battlefields look like. So people at home are going to have a close connection to the war. And it's also uh, pretty ironic because this photo of Alfred Wad, he is a wartime sketch artist, but there is a photograph of him which shows the development of another big breakthrough in communication, which is the photograph. So the photograph first um, comes out you know, in the late 1840s and 1850s, but by the time of the Civil War, they've developed it, it's grown, and the Civil War is really the first big major war that's gonna be photographed on a large scale. And uh, photographers are gonna take pictures of dead bodies and the gruesome impact of the war. Um, and that's really gonna impact people at home. Um, and you can see strong anti-war sentiment in both the North and the South come out of the photographs. It's also great for us as historians because for really the first time we can see a major conflict, um, we can see exactly what it looked like instead of relying on photos or things like that. Now another thing we, we can discuss um, is on the battlefield how communication happened. And the Civil War is interesting because it's sort of at this confluence of time. When on the battlefield, a lot of the ways that people are that uh, generals and soldiers are communicating are still using the old forms of music, like drums and fifes and bugles. And um, this is, you know, th these forms of communication have been around for hundreds of years, uh, but they're still the most efficient way. But at the same time, we're seeing new things develop as well, such as the signal corps which is the use of flags to communicate things long distances outside of earshot. So the, the modern United States Signal Corps, that's still a big part of the United States Army, is born during the American Civil War with the use of these flags, which is interesting. And one of the most um, impactful developments on the battlefield itself on how uh, deadly the war was, was the importance of the railroad. So railroads are going to be hugely important to uh, both sides during the war. Again, they were developed in the 1830s and 40s, but by the time of the 1860s, they've really grown, and railroads are going to be important because they're going to allow um, both sides to transport men and goods much more quickly and efficiently. So this will mean two things. One, uh, after a battle, either side, maybe if you lose, you'll be able to recover much more quickly. You can send more men to where you just lost and reinforce yourself. Or you can send more supplies and make your army recover much more quickly. Also, because you can send supplies so much more efficiently, your armies can grow to much larger sizes. The more food you can give your soldiers, the more soldiers you can have. And so because of these huge armies, we're going to see huge high casualties as well. So in this case here, we have some um, objects that show, um, that give you some examples of the types of communication I just discussed. We have some uh, telegraph examples, uh, machines here. Uh, we also have a Civil War era camera, just to give you a sense of how big and antiquated to our modern eyes this was, but this was breakthrough technology at that time. And then we can see those older forms of communication, the fife and that bugle. So the Civil War is really a transformative time when it comes to technology and its impact on how war is fought. Now, we're going to move on from the Civil War and talk about uh, communication that occurred after the Civil War. It's a little bit more abstract, but before we do, at the end of the Civil War, um, you know, the Confederacy surrendered, um, and we enter into a period of time that's known as Reconstruction. So the country has to recover from this enormously destructive war, both physically, you know, the country was devastated, hundreds of thousands of people had died, but also politically and emotionally, because again, at the end of the war, uh, roughly four million enslaved people are now free. And after the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments in the mid-1860s, formerly enslaved people are now citizens of the United States, and they now have the right to vote. So there's this huge political revolution that's going on in the aftermath of the war as well. And for a while, African Americans in the South did have these great rights. They were able to vote. Uh, we see dozens of 
um, African Americans serving in political offices that they never would have been able to do before. They're getting educations. However, quickly, uh, former Confederates in the South, uh, white leaders, are going to start reacting against these, um, these advances for African Americans. And um, we're going to see former Confederates take back control of most of the uh, for former Confederacy um, and start implementing laws that restrict African Americans and their rights. And one of the interesting ways that we should also look at this is how the Civil War was remembered. And uh, memory, I think, is a great way of how the past is communicated to us today. So we're going to be talking about the lost cause in particular. Um, and the lost cause is this notion that um, this movement that sort of occurred by the 1870s or so and was a really strong movement all the way through the 1950s, 1960s, and we're still dealing with the remnants of the lost cause ideology to this day. And the lost cause, briefly, uh, was this idea that the Confederacy and that the South did not secede because of slavery, that slavery was not the cause of the Civil War. Instead, it was a difference of states' rights. And that slavery was actually a positive good um, for enslaved people. Enslaved people were not uh, liked being slaves, basically. Um, and also this idea that Confederate soldiers and generals were th these chivalrous um, Christian warriors that were just doing what they thought was right, and they should be honored as such. And so we see, especially here in Richmond, Virginia, uh, a great example of the lost cause in all of the monuments that are put up on Monument Avenue. Here is a plaster mold of the Stonewall Jackson Monument that um, was erected in 1919, just a few blocks from where our museum sits today. Also, our museum is um, related to the lost cause. In the, the original building, which was known as Battle Abbey. And it was built by this organization known as the Confederate Memorial Association, which wanted to create a, a temple-like building where they could remember the fallen and they could celebrate the efforts of, conf of the Confederacy. Um, and this building was, was part of that as well. You can also see these um, uh, pins here are, are examples from, uh, uh, originally, yes, <laughs> very good. Uh, our museum has changed ownership. We have we are no connection to the Confederate Memorial Association today. That was many years ago in the 1920s, and it's just the building itself. That is very good to make clear. Thank you to my colleagues. Um, but we can also talk about how these large organizations of Confederate uh, veterans came together to celebrate um, what they did and to put up these monuments as well. Many of these. Um, Many of these large gatherings happened here in Virginia. Hundreds of thousands of uh, Confederate veterans would come together and celebrate their efforts. And again, this is all going on uh, while enslaved people, or excuse me, African Americans um, are not given a voice in how to remember the Civil War. They're often ignored, even though they have much different feelings about what happened during the Civil War than these former Confederates did. Um, and we can also see the impact of the lost cause on popular culture, like movies like Gone with the Wind and um, The Birth of a Nation. Some of the most popular of their day are giving this false impression of the uh, causes and the results of the war. Um, and so we're still dealing with trying to correct that message and correct that false narrative. And that's part of the job of us here at the museum is to tell a more inclusive and more um, accurate view of the past as opposed to these distorted views. So again, it's very important to think about who is telling the history and what their motivations might be. Um, and so that's a really uh, important form of communication. And lastly, we want to end on a, a lighter note and talk about some more just plain obvious forms of communication that, that are on display in our museum, like this telephone here. Again, technology is rapidly changing from the mid-1800s throughout the uh, start of the 1900s. And so we see the development of the light bulb and the, and the, um, and the telephone in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, behind us here, we have an example of uh, a Richmond uh, trolley that was electrified. Our, the city of Richmond is actually the first major city in the entire world that had an electric streetcar system. And this is an example of it. Um, so, so again, technology um, in the realm of communication is really going to transform the way Virginians and Americans and people all over the world live their daily lives. So that is going to conclude our time together. Um, now, before we end, I do want to briefly mention 
that we have a bunch of other events coming up soon. So if, um, if you want to find out all the details about those events, when they're taking place, and how to sign up for them, please visit our website at virginiahistory.org, and then you can go to the events page. Uh, but some of the upcoming things we have, we have uh, movie myth bustings in November, more movie myth bustings. We also have more gallery walks like this. Um, for Virginia History Day, I'm hosting a series of workshops for educators and parents. So if you want to know more about how to get involved in Virginia History Day, please check out those events. We would love to have you. And these are all free, by the way. Um, then we also have banner lectures for adults and more webinars for students and teachers as well. So a bunch of great stuff please check out our website and we hope to see you at more of these events soon. All right, so Sam, we are going to wait to let people submit their questions um, using the comments feature on Facebook or YouTube, but since we had some audio trouble at the beginning, can you restate, restate the theme and tell people how they can get involved in VHD? Of course, yes. Yeah, so this year's theme for um, Virginia History Day and, and National History Day overall um, is communication and history, the key to understanding. So that means that every student's project this year has to relate to that theme, communication and history, in some way. Now, the best way to get involved is to do so through your school or your teacher. Um, but if your school or teacher doesn't support uh, history Day, or they don't have time to engage in it, that's okay. You don't have to do it through your school or teacher. Um, you can also do it just by yourself with your parents. So if you and your parents want to work on a project together, um, uh, you can find out more about how to enter the contest, when deadlines are, uh, on our website. Again, that's virginiahistory.org. You go to the Learn tab at the top. Underneath that, you'll see um, Virginia History Day. Just click on that and there's all the information you need, you need to you know. you can get directly to the VHD site at virginiahistory.org slash VHD. Perfect. Yes. So um, Haley just reminded me that you can get directly to the Virginia History Day website by going to virginiahistoryday.org slash VHD. So one click stop. <laughs> um, all right. So Sam, I don't see any questions so far. Um, you told us a little bit how people can get involved. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that might be it. Sure. Um, and people can, um, your contact information is on the site. Exactly. So if you uh, want to get involved as a student or if you want to volunteer, we always need volunteers every year as well as judges um, and, and those kinds of things. So if you have a love of history and you want to help students learn more about history, uh, please reach out to me. My email is sflorer at virginiahistory.org. So it's really easy. You can find all that on the website as well. So I think that is going to do it for us today. Again, thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate you. Um, and we hope to see you at one of our upcoming programs soon. So